Welcome to ISGIP Live Journal Club. I'm your moderator, Natalie Benet. This month's theme is ovarian neoplasms non-serous. And first off, I'll just briefly talk about ISGIP Live and what's happening um, in the future. So the next event will be on January 7th after this one, where Dr. Glenn McCluggage will present a live webinar about problematic areas and updates on non-epithelial ovarian neoplasms. And then on January 14th, there will be a live slide session with Dr. Karen Talia about a practical approach to endocervical glandular lesions, benign and malignant. And you may notice that we have a webinar and a slide session happening in the same month. So in the next six month block for the schedule, the frequency of the events has increased. So you can see the schedule and register for events at isgip.ca. So this, these are the objectives of Journal Club to engage trainees in gaining scientific knowledge and the ability to critically evaluate the literature to offer opportunities for trainees and young members from all parts of the globe to volunteers, presenters, and moderators to provide mentorship and to engage the future of leaders in our field from around the globe. And I would just like to note here that if you would like to join ISGIP, you can do so. It is free for trainees and um, there is a sliding scale in terms of membership dues based on um, the country that you live in and your ability to pay. So that's not something that should prevent you from joining. You can always contact me and reach out to me about that. Also, if you are a trainee or if you know a trainee who would like to present, I think the feedback that I'm getting is that it's a positive experience and I provide feedback before the journal club about the presentations for folks. So um, not to be intimidated. And I, I would encourage you to reach out to me if you or someone you know would like to present. So this month's theme is ovarian serous, or I'm sorry, ovarian neoplasms non serous And the articles we are presenting are these three, which we will hear about from our presenters who are these three, three fine folks. Um, first is Dr. Jayati Dada, who is joining us. Hi, Dr. Dada, I'm glad you made it in time. <laughs> I had an emergency plan to present your recording, but I'm so glad we get to hear from you live. So Dr. Dada is a consultant in histopathology at the Drs. Trebetti and Roy Diagnostic Laboratories in Kolkata, India. Our second presenter is Dr. Fuad Zaka, who is a PGY4 at Brown University and will be pursuing fellowship training unfortunately not in GYN pathology, but in cytopathology and head and neck pathology. So we're happy to have him back. And Dr. Hanan Ribeiro, who is a GYN and breast pathology fellow at my institution at Women and Infants Hospital in Rhode Island. And he will be returning to um, his home country of Brazil soon and we are going to miss him dearly. So we're, um, we're glad to have all three presenters this month. So the schedule, I will briefly give intros. Then we'll march through the three presentations, which should each take, each take about 15 minutes. Um, for each presentation, the um, talk will last about 12 minutes, and then we'll have two polling questions after each presentation, and the floor will be open for discussion. You can provide your Q&A at the tab at the bottom, which is in the black bar. You can type in your questions there. You can also, as indicated with the second blue arrow, upvote other people's questions and we'll prioritize those for answering. And I would encourage you to put any questions or even feedback you have for the presenters there. You can put the chat in the chat. You can put feedback that doesn't need to be read live, but try not to use that for questions. It's kind of hard for me to monitor both things all the time. So now I will stop sharing. And Dr. Dada, if you are ready, you can go ahead and share your screen and start your presentation. Uh, hello all. Um, this is Dr. Jayati from Kolkata, India. And my topic for today's Gynec Pathology Journal Club is this beautiful article in the journal, American Journal of Surgical Pathology by Susanna Leskela et al. on molecular heterogeneity of endometrioid ovarian carcinomas and analysis of 166 cases using the endometrial cancer surrogate molecular classification. So endometrioid ovarian carcinomas has a better prognosis than other histologic types of ovarian cancer and stage is considered the most important prognostic factor so far. However, it is an imperfect prognostic tool in some cases and there's a need for better prognostic classifier and it has a low but unchanged mortality over the years and there remains a scope for therapeutic improvement. With this background, this study was uh, 
device to analyze the molecular heterogeneity of endometrioid ovary and cancers and to evaluate the prognostic significance of molecular classification. So analogous to the molecular classification of endometrial endometrioid cancers uh, as um, guided by the Cancer Genome Atlas uh, Research Network, ovarian endometrioid carcinomas were classified into four groups. The ultramutated group with full exonuclease domain mutation, the hypermutated group with microsatellite instability, then cancers with extensive somatic copy number alteration and low mutation rate consisting primarily of serous like cancers, but also 10% of endometrioid carcinomas, that is the P53 mutated group, and last, the microsatellite stable endometrioid cancer with low mutation frequency and low somatic copy number alteration, which were classified as no specific molecular phenotype. 166 early stage endometrioid ovarian cancers confirmed centrally by histology and immunohistochemistry were analyzed, tissue microarray were prepared, and HNE stained sections of the array were reviewed to confirm the presence of morphologically representative areas. The morphologic features recorded included conventional squamous metaplasia, morular metaplasia, mucinous metaplasia, necrosis, and endometriosis. IHCs were performed for mismatch repair proteins and P53. Sanger sequencing were done for exonuclease domain uh, of polymerase epsilon mutation. And for tumors showing mutation, next generation sequencing analysis were done to confirm the ultramutated profile. Now the results. The average age of the patients were 51.6 years. The commonest was stage 1C. Uh, there were also a lot of patients in FIGO stage 1A and 1B group. The typical IHC pattern was negative for WT1 and napsin A and PR positivity. Only three tumors were focally WT1 positive. 50% of the tumor had a histologic grade 1 according to FIGO. Uh, grade 2 and grade 3 cases were also there. The results of molecular studies uh, Eight tumors, that is 5% carried a pole EDM mutation, that is an ultramutated profile. 29 showed mismatch repair deficiency, that is hypermutated group. 16 tumors had a mutated pattern of P53 expression, and 114 didn't have any of the previous alteration. Of note, five tumors showed more than one classification criteria. Two were pole mutated as well as mismatch repair deficient. One was Pole mutated and P53 mutated, and two showed mismatch repair deficiency along with P53 mutation. P53 mutated tumor, as expected, were grade 3 in most of the cases. Notably, 32% cases were grade 3 when utilizing the FIGO grade, and 67% were grade 3 when using the silver bar grading system. At least 70% of tumors from other molecular groups were either grade 1 or grade 2. Squamous and modular metaplasia were most commonly seen in the NST group. Necrosis was present in 75% of the cases in ultramutated group and 52% cases in the P53 abnormal group. Endometriosis was detected in one cases of the mismatch repair deficient group and 11% of the NST group, but it was not there in the other two molecular groups. There were significant IHC differences between the group. Besides P53 abnormal group, a mutated P53 pattern of IHC was detected in one ultramutated and two hypermutated tumor. Diffuse P16 expression were most commonly detected in P53 mutated tumors. It was there in less than 15% of the other groups. Both P53 abnormal and NST groups showed nuclear beta-catenin expression in almost one third of the samples. The ER was most prevalent in hypermutated and NST groups. Less than 50% of the ultramutated and P53 abnormal tumors were ER positive. More than 80% of the samples in each group showed expression of PR and there were no significant differences between the different molecular groups. Loss of arid 1A were most common in hypermutated and NST1 tumors, NST tumors. Napsin A expression was most common in hypermutated tumors. 
HLF beta 1 loss was most common in hypermutated tumor. And interestingly, the number of tumor infiltrating lymphocytes were higher in ultramutated and hypermutated tumors. Coming to the molecular features, in ultramutated endometrioid ovarian carcinomas, the number of mutation per case was 8.5, and most commonly mutated genes were arid one a pic P3R1, P10, BCOR, and TP53. No mutation was detected in KRAS. Hypermutated endometrioid cancers also had arid one a as the most frequently mutated gene, followed by P10, PIK3CA, Mutation in pic 3 r one BCOR, and TP53 were far less common, and mutation of KRAS were detected in 21% of the tumors. Now, if we uh, consider the distribution of grade in endometrioid ovarian and endometrioid endometrial carcinomas according to the molecular subgroups, there were an interesting difference. The frequency of hypermutated and ultramutated tumors were lower in endometrioid ovarian carcinomas compared to endometrioid endometrial carcinomas, particularly in grade 3 tumors, as uh, reflected in this table. And this could reflect the difference in tumor microenvironment. The previous studies have also reported difference in mutation spectrum of these two tumors, like Endometrioid endometrial carcinomas had more frequent P10 mutation, whereas endometrioid ovarian carcinomas had more frequent CTNNB1 mutation. 87% of tumors in this study group were low grade, grade 1 or grade 2. They had a high frequency of modular metaplasia, which could be due to greater frequency of beta catenin, that is CTNNB1 mutation also suggested by high frequency of nuclear beta-catenin expression in this group. P53 abnormal endometrioid ovarian carcinomas were common in older age, and they were more frequently grade 2, grade 3. Interestingly, as uh, I mentioned earlier also, greater difference were observed in this group in frequency of grade 3 tumors when applying the uh, Silverberg and FIGO grading system, suggesting major proliferation in this group. High frequency of nuclear beta catenin expression in P53 abnormal group can suggest that some of the P53 abnormal tumors progress from CTNNB1 mutated endometrioid ovarian cancers. Mismatch repair deficiency were seen in 18% of the endometrioid ovarian carcinomas, 2.4% of the clear cell carcinomas, but they were absent in serous or mucinous carcinomas. Most hypermutated endometrioid ovarian carcinomas were grade 1 or grade 2 in contrast to the endometrial varieties where the hypermutated carcinomas were mostly G3. Nearly half of the hypermutated carcinomas show mucinous differentiation, a fact also reported in endometrioid endometrial carcinomas in some series. When complete molecular studies were carried out, including MLH1 promoted methylation analysis, MLH1 hypermethylation was detected in six tumors, indicating a sporadic origin. Pathogenic germline mutation of MLH1, MSH2, or MSH6 were seen in seven samples, indicating a Lynch syndrome. However, two additional tumors with MSH2, MSH loss didn't show any pathogenic germline or somatic mutation in the MMR gene. And this can possibly be, be due to the complex germline or somatic mutation, which could not be detected by the study panel used. Ultramutated, that is pole exonuclease domain mutation carcinomas, were detected in 2.8 to 9.7% in previous four series. And when all the data were analyzed together, a 7.5% of the tumors carry this mutation, and grade 3 carcinomas represented up to one third of this group. Similarly to the, similar to the P53 abnormal group, another morphologic characteristic was presence of necrosis even in low-grade tumor. So thereby, there is a potential utility of pole mutation testing in high-grade endometrioid ovarian carcinomas, uh, particularly because this group showed a uh, better uh, recurrence-free survival. 
there was a difference in mutational spectrum of ultra mutated and hyper mutated tumors t53 brca2 and pic3 r1 mutation were most frequent among whole mutated endometrioid ovarian carcinomas in addition to a higher number of mutation pathways pit and mutation occur at similar high frequency in both the groups demonstrating the importance of this gene in the development of endometrioid ovarian carcinomas whereas mutation in pic3 r1 seem to be more specific of whole mutated tumor and pic3 ca seem to be more specific of mismatch repair deficient tumors respectively there is some prognostic significance of this molecular classification although no association could be established between endometrioid ovarian carcinomas and prognosis in multivariate analysis based on this study probably uh, this is because uh, this study only included early stage endometrioid ovarian carcinomas and some of the groups like whole mutated group carried very low number of cases however there were some interesting observations none of the patient carrying whole mutated tumor had recurrence or death a finding also observed in previous study by para heron et al and there were higher frequency of recurrence and death among patient with p53 abnormal tumor further studies including a larger number of patients are necessary to establish the prognostic significance of this molecular classification therapeutic implication is also possible on this molecular classification because uh, similar to mismatch repair deficient and whole mutated tumors in other location hyper mutated and ultra mutated endometrioid ovarian carcinomas can be good candidates for immunotherapy and in further support of this conclusion this study demonstrated a high number of cd8 positive tumor infiltrating lymphocytes in these two groups there are scopes of improvement in this study this study included only early stage endometrioid ovarian carcinomas and some of the group like whole exonuclease domain mutated group carried very low number of cases however this study had a large number of cases so the conclusion from this study is that correlation between morphology and clinical outcome is imperfect for precision medicine that needs a combined approach for integrating molecular information and molecular data and immunohistochemistry in consult with morphology may be helpful in subclassifying endometrioid ovarian carcinomas into clinically meaningful categories that's all from my uh, end today uh, so yeah over to you yeah thank you that was a really good job i think um, every month I try to pick different kinds of articles, right? I always try to pick some that are more case series and then one that's pretty molecular heavy. And you did a really good job summarizing this. It was very information dense. So I um, appreciate that. So I'm going to launch the polling now for those in the audience. You should be able to see the polling about this article. So go ahead and answer those questions and then um, I will go over them. And Dr. Dada, you're welcome to comment when people have started answering the questions, but we'll give people about a minute to pull that together. And I will also share my screen so that those watching the video, because for some strange reason, Zoom has decided when you record that the polls don't show up. So they'll also be able to see. And then I'll share the results. So we have the first question here. Um, which of the following is true regarding endometrioid ovarian carcinoma? And there were multiple answer types. The one that is correct is certain subtypes, namely the hypermutated and ultramutated have been shown to respond to immunotherapy. So it looks like 75% of the folks who answered that poll live answered that. Um, a few um, synchronous endometrioid, endometrioid, endometrial endometrioid carcinoma is present in 50%. That's high. It's about 5 to 10%. And you can see the comments at the bottom. Usually the way I write these questions, which is how we're supposed to write test questions these days, is um, not a, you know, a negative stem. So I just changed the first four answers to make, or you know, the, the wrong answers to make them wrong. And the, the fun part is trying to figure out what I changed to make it wrong. So the second question um, it looks like was uh, which of the following is a finding of this study and the correct answer was grade three carcinomas represented up to one third of the ultra mutated carcinoma suggesting the potential utility of pole e mutational testing, at least in high grade. Um, 
carcinomas, which is the group of tumors for which a more aggressive treatment is recommended. So um, Dr. Dada, I thought, did a good job covering this, um, this topic um, during her presentation. And um, something that I find interesting is um, I wonder what folks in, in parts of the world are doing where there maybe isn't mutational testing available. Do you know, is this something that you all are doing where you're practicing, Dr. Dada? No, uh, at present, I don't have access to pole mutation, but I think it's uh, uh, nice to remember that uh, these carcinomas look bad, but they don't behave bad. Yeah, it is nice. It is nice. And and I'm sure any patient who could get the news that, well, you have a really high grade tumor, but, you know, that but, but we we know something now that maybe we didn't know 10 years ago about, about the prognosis and possible, you know, immunotherapy or other um, um, interventions. So um, that was a really nice presentation. And let me just check. Oh, there is a question in here. Let's see. What it is. Um, right. So how um, we have a question asking how the molecular classification of ovarian endometrioid carcinoma diverges from that of the endometrial endometrioid adenocarcinomas. Um, this is kind of a complex question, I think. Um, I will tell you what, I have a nice chart that I made for a different presentation. I see that's Dr. Disgupta. I've, I remember you, so hi, how are you? I know you can't talk back to me because we're in a webinar, but what I'll do is on the website, when I post the YouTube video, I'll put the chart that I have for the endometrial classification scheme and we can compare it to what they've laid out in this article. They are very similar and I think, um, mostly are being utilized more heavily in the endometrial um, sort of arena. So, okay. So we'll go ahead and do our second presentation now. I believe it's, um, uh, let's, I have to stop sharing. It's you, uh, Dr. Zaka, so. Um, so again, hi everyone, my name is Fouad. I'm PGY4 at Brown and thank you so much for attending uh, this meeting today and, and giving me the opportunity to present. Um, the article which I'm presenting is out of Italy, um, and it's titled Mutational and Immunophenotypic Profiling of a Series of Eight Tubal Ovarian Carcinosarcomas Revealed a Monoclonal Origin of the Disease. Um, I'm sorry, I just need to get some of the Zoom um, toolbars out of the way. I can't see my own slides. Okay, so I'm going to start with the study design. The authors examined, sorry, the authors examined the heterogeneity of tubal ovarian carcinoma, carcinosarcomas and the therapeutic implications. Um, this is what they, what they set out to investigate in the beginning, and we'll see how much they actually were able to reach that conclusion. So they looked at morphology, immunohistochemistry, and molecular studies. Um, and just a background, a background, carcinosarcomas, also known as uh, triple MT, malarian tumors, um, these are biphasic neoplasms. Both components of the neoplasm are malignant. They're highly aggressive. They have a poor prognosis. The most common epithelial component is high-grade serous. And the sarcomatous component could be either homologous, which means indigenous to the malarian line, or heterologous, where we could see non-ovarian tissue, such as cartilage, bone, or striated muscle. So in terms of histogenesis, there are three uh, hypotheses of how these tumors come to arise. Uh, first of all, there's the collision theory, which um, posits that there are two distinct malign malignant populations comprising the tumor. It's a combination theory where uh, we think it's a common cell, which eventually differentiates into two cell lines. And there, there's the conversion theory, where we believe that there's a metaplastic transformation of one cell type to give us these two biphasic components. And this is a great um, example of carcinosarcoma, um, courtesy of Dr. Benet's uh, um, cases. Uh, on here, you can see the uh, epithelial component, which is uh, very malignant looking high grade serous. And um, to the right, you could see the sarcomatous component, which here uh, has some osteosarcoma and uh, chondrosarcoma as well. This is also, uh, this case also had some rhabdomyosarcoma differentiation, and you could even see uh, Z lines in this case, uh, which is just an amazing uh, photo from Dr. Benet. Uh, so then moving on to the materials and methods. The authors had eight cases, six were ovarian, two tubal carcinosarcomas, and it was um, from one institution, their own one institution. 
They were diagnosed by two uh, expert GYN pathologists using h &E and IHC. All the cases were staged according to the uh, international FIGO system. And then they also reviewed the clinical records for the patients that they looked at. Um, and the IHC was done uh, with the Leica bond system. The way they graded, graded the IHC staining was uh, zero for absent staining, one plus for focal or weak, two plus for diffuse weak, and three plus if it was diffusely strong. Um, they did micro dissection DNA extraction as well. They used QIA AMP DNA FFPE tissue kit, uh, also from uh, Italy. And the TP53 and DICER1 mutational analysis was performed using Sanger sequencing. And here they sequenced selected axons, not the entire gene. Uh, they also did hotspot for KRAS, NRAS, BRAS, and PIK3CA uh, mutational profiling. And they used sequinome mass array system. So what results did they have? They uh, showed heterologous differentiation in uh, six out of eight tumors. Cytokeratin EMA were positive in the carcinomatous component of all the tumors uh, and in 87.5 and 50% of all the sarcomatous components respectively. Vimentin was positive in all the sar sarcomatous components and four informative uh, tumors had mutated where they were able to pick up mutational signatures on them. Out of these, uh, three tumors showed TP53 TP TP mutation, uh, two of which uh, had TP53 mutation in both the epithelial and mesenchymal components. And one tumor showed DICER1 mutation in both the epithelial and mesenchymal components. And then uh, when they looked at KRAS, NRAS, BRAF, PIP3CA did, did not identify any mutations. So um, looking at a summary of their clinical pathologic features, like we said, they had eight cases. The age, the median age was 63.5, and this they felt correlated with previous studies. The tumor size was 14.5 uh, uh, centimeters on average. And then in terms of uh, epithelial histology, the most common was serous, like they said, with endometrioid being uh, second, and one, more than one carcinoma uh, type in three tumors were observed. In terms of mesenchymal histology, um, two tumors were uh, showed homologous mesenchymal components and heterologous in six. And out of these, they saw rhabdomyosarcoma sarcoma in two, chondrosarcoma in one, and more than one sarco sarcoma type in three of them. Uh, in terms of staging, most cases were stage three when they were diagnosed and the overall survival range in months was 23. Um, this is uh, one of their cases where they just showed how uh, diverse uh, the tumor could be. Um, I'm sorry, this is not one of their cases. There was just a, a histology profile uh, of the cases. They had cases that had high-grade serous uh, component for the epithelial uh, part. This is a, a homologous sarcomatous component here. Uh, figure um, panel C shows an endometrioid component and D is a um, heterologous uh, rhabdomyoblastic uh, component. And E, you see osteoid and uh, chondroid differentiation. And in F, they even found a neuroendocrine component in the epithelial part, which was positive for chromogranin in the inset. And this is just a summary of the immunohistochemical findings, which we kind of touched up on. Um, all of the uh, MNF-116 is the cytokeratin that they use, and it stained the carcinomatous component in all the all their cases uh, and quite strongly. And it was uh, present in some of the sarcomatous components as well. EMA was positive in all the carcinomatous components and some of the sarcomatous and Vimentin was positive in all of the uh, sarcomatous components. Uh, S100 chromogranin and synaptophysin were, um, you know, dependent on what kind of differentiation the tumors showed. So here they're looking at three cases that had TP TP53 mutation. And uh, there again, the cytokeratin was positive in all the epithelial component. Vimentin was positive in all the sarcomatous and some of the epithelial sometimes. And the um, synaptophysin was positive in one case that showed uh, neuroendocrine differentiation. EMA was positive mostly uh, in the epithelial uh, components. Desmond and uh, MIF4, you can see with their particular differentiation. And what they found was that 
P53 IC staining was positive in the nuclear, nucleus and the cytoplasm in these cases, except for one case where we're, it was positive only in the cytoplasm, which is a finding uh, they felt was kind of novel uh, that they saw. And then when they looked at the DICER-1 mutated uh, case, uh, here um, you just see the DICER-1 um, exon uh, that was mutated, the sequence. And they're showing the epithelial component here, which is high-grade serous. There was some poorly differentiated uh, chondroid, um, poorly differentiated tumor in the mesenchymal component with some chondroid differentiation. Um, there was focal cal retinin positivity. EMA only showed some sparse epithelial remnant of the tumor and inhibin was totally negative here. So um, moving on to the discussion for the article, in historical context, the clinical findings that they found, were, they saw were in agreement with earlier studies. So in terms of age, tumor size, survival, they did not uncover anything that um, was novel. The IHC patterns were also uh, co uh, corresponded to earlier findings. And um, what they contributed actually, they feel that their study was one of the largest carcinoma uh, carcinoma sarcoma studies of tubo ovarian origin. And the reason for this is that most of the other studies on uh, malaria and carcinoma sarcomas were of uterine origin. They found TP53 mutations in three of eight of their cases. Uh, and two cases, it stained both the epithelial and mesenchymal. Uh, both lines were mutated. And in one case, only the mesenchymal uh, component was mutated for TP53. And they felt that they posited actually that the reason for that was maybe as the disease progressed, the tumor became polyclonal and lost the epithelial um, TP53 mutation. In terms of unexpected findings, they uh, reported the highest rate of TP53 mutation uh, ever seen in ovarian carcinoma sarcomas. All of their cases were positive. Um, and it was the first report of cytoplasmic TP53 staining in one case. And then, um, they uh, posited as well that since three out of four informative tumors show the same mutations in both components, the epithelial and mesenchymal, so in this case it was two for, two P for TP53 and one for DICER1, this suggested a monoclonal origin, uh, i.e. the combination theory that we discussed. In terms of clinical applications, even though they said um, at the outset that this was one of the things they were attempting to answer, um, I didn't see any reference to uh, you know, specific clinical applications for the study. And in terms of areas of improvement, they recognize that you know, they, they need a, a larger number of cases for their study. Um, I thought that strength of the article was combining morphology, IHC, and molecular, that they did it in, in an elegant way, and that's very informative. Um, and they started setting a fairly credible course towards the origin of, of, of ovarian carcinosarcomas. And how are these tumors, you know, um, starting off, but not so much um, relating the different um, the different types in terms of clonality, in terms of how they behave or how maybe they can be treated. In terms of areas of improvement, since histology and the IHC serve mostly to diagnose the tumor, uh, the molecular studies are really what are uh, giving us an idea about how these tumors are originating. So I felt that maybe a larger study could give us a better understanding of mutation signatures and how these tumors really originate. Um, and as I said, clinical application was really scant here. Um, and then another question that came up for me is like, how important is origin versus destination? So how do tumors that have and maintain a monoclonal profile behave versus those that are polyclonal, either since inception polyclonal, uh, if that exists, or transform along the way, uh, like their one case that lost the P53 and the epithelial component. Um, for applications, I felt that, you know, for me as a trainee, I need to maintain a low threshold for possible, uh, for possible sarcomatous components and not just, uh, you know, glance over that. And in the future, it would be great if there was a multi-institutional study just to ramp up the numbers uh, for this kind of tumor to get, you know, a more meaningful idea of uh, clonality and origin. Thank you. Thank you. That was really, that was a good presentation. I, um, I like this paper for the reasons you talked about. It's, it's novel. The uh, majority of the times we, we talk about and read about carcinosarcoma of mullerian origin, it's usually in the endometrium. And I thought they did a good job 
Um, and like you said, they didn't really find clinical application. I think they hoped that they would find, you know, um, oh, you can stop sharing if you want, but they, yeah. they were hoping that they would find, that's okay. Um, they would find um, targetable mutations, although they weren't really, see, like they weren't really looking at a lot of the, um, you know, targetable mutations, but I, I think that that's what they were hoping to do. Um, and it, it, it was well done in terms of just being very thorough. Um, and like I said, that they were hunting for therapeutic options. That seems to be what, what a lot of studies are doing these days. That was what the yeah. last study did as well. Um, and I did think it was interesting that they found um, common mutational patterns with between the two components of the tumor. I always find carcinosarcoma to be, or triple MT, however you want to call it, um, a very interesting tumor. And like you said, as a trainee and even as a, an attending or a, you know, a fully fledged pathologist, it's always important to remind yourself to hunt for that when you're in a carcinoma. Even low grade carcinomas can have sarcomatous components. So um, we will launch our polling questions now for, this is this article. Okay. And then I will bring up the questions for those watching online. Go ahead and end the poll. And Dr. Zaka, can you see the results as well? Yes, I can. Okay. okay. So yeah, thanks. Thanks for answering. Um, so for the first question, which of the following is true regarding tubular ovarian carcinosarcoma? Uh, the answer is um, the most common epithelial component is high-grade serous carcinoma, uh, which is what the authors found and which is what we know. Um, the first um, option, only one of the biphasin components needs to be malignant. And by definition, both uh, components need to be malignant. Prognosis is um, not at all favorable. And um, immunohistochemistry might help uh, highlighting the different components of the sarcomatous uh, part or uh, neuroendocrine differentiation, for example. But um, you know, the diagnosis is made mostly by um, h and &E, by, by morphology. Let me just interject here for those watching mm -hmm. online who can't see the polling results that 87% of folks called the third answer the correct answer and then we had 13% of folks choosing that final answer. And like Dr. Zaka mentioned that immunohistochemistry, I find it very interesting um, among people who trained at different institutions. Some people routinely or really like to use immunohistochemistry when they're diagnosing triple MT. I was trained at a place where morphology was really the diagnostic um, uh, sort of gold standard. So I really liked this article because it, it was telling me things that I don't use on a daily basis, like how different immunomarkers compare in the two components. And it was interesting, like you said, that they kind of leaned on it more heavily for finding that sarcomatous component a lot of the times it seemed like. Yeah. So, okay, I'm sorry, you can go ahead and go over your- No, thanks, thanks for that. Yeah. So yeah. second question, a finding of this study uh, is tubal ovarian carcinosarcomas are rampant among the pediatric population, DICER-1 mutation. So this answer, goes got uh, 3%. And DICER-1 mutation was the most commonly uh, common anomaly identified. This option got 6% of answers. And contrary to prior studies, T53 mutations were not identified by this group. This got 3%. Um, and last option, the current study supports the origin, that the origin of these tumors is the common cell, dif cell differentiating into two cell lines. And this option got 87%, which is the correct answer. Um, and this uh, speaks to the combination uh, theory, which, uh, which the authors uh, talked about and finding a mutation in both the epithelial and mesenchymal uh, components of the tumor to support that. Yeah. Um, so in terms of the, the other options, tubular ovarian carcinosarcomas are, is an adult tumor and DICER-1 mutation was not the most common mutation, it was TP53. And, um, and the, the third option is also self-explanatory. They did find TP53 and, and built a lot of their conclusions around it. Um, Dr. Bene, I also see that Dr. Descupta has a comment in the chat. Yeah, he's, he um, said, very nice presentation. Histogenesis versus differentiation is a really important as well as philosophical question. Only the soft tissue yeah. folks settled it for differentiation. So and This this reminds me of, of uh, our soft tissue pathologist. Whenever we ask him, uh, you know, so what is the cell of origin here? And he always uh, will tell us like it really doesn't matter as much as where this tumor is going. Uh, I always remember that from him. And, and triple MTs are like the immature teratoma of, you know, the epithelial line. You know, they can literally do anything that they want. They can make yeah. 
multiple different kinds of epithelial tumors. They can make yolk sac tumor. They can make, you know, they can do whatever. So just keep an open mind when you're in a triple MT because you can, you know, you'll go all different places. I like that soft tissue um, quote too. I might have to start saying yeah. that. Okay, so we can um, go to our third presentation now, Dr. Ribeiro. My name is Hina, I'm from Brazil. I'm currently pursuing the International Fellowship at Women and Infants Hospital of Rhode Island. I'm happy to be here. We're gonna talk about a topic that is less malignant than the previous two topics that were addressed, but it's not less interesting because of that. And it also brings some uh, interesting philosophical questions. So I'm gonna talk about a paper entitled Ovarian Serumucinous Cyst Adenomas and Endofibromas, the first report of a case series. This was published very recently in Histopathology by Drs. Ali Ben Musa and uh, Glenn McCluglidge. And well, this is a case series. So in terms of study design, it's fairly simple. So I'm gonna stick mostly to the background that motivated this study. Um, as a category, Ovarian serumucinous tumors were recently introduced in the WHO classification. This happened in the 2014 edition. These tumors are defined as benign tumors that have at least two Mullerian epithelial phenotypes in them, and they have to make up at least 10% of the tumor volume. And this, uh, this category of tumors, especially the benign serumucinous tumors, they were introduced sort of as a more of a theoretical precursor to what we know is the borderline serumucinous tumors. These are, uh, have been more widely studied and we have more information about them. But since things in the ovaries seem to follow the cyst adenoma or adenofibroma borderline carcinoma progression, these were introduced in the classification as well, even though there, there wasn't a lot of information available at the time. Uh, we did know that they have an association with endometriosis, as do the borderline counterpart. And because of this lack of uh, solid information, the aim of this study was to report a series of benign ovarian serumucinous tumors. So 22 cases that were diagnosed between 2010 and 2020 were selected. These cases have been uh, were double-coded as having serous and mucinous cyst adenoma and adenofibroma in the author's institution. And this is how they found the cases through the SNOMED codes. And the authors reviewed the histology and the clinical information. So this table summarizes pretty much the most important findings of the study. Um, you can see on the left here that the patient age was uh, followed a very wide range from 32 to 83 years old with the mean being 62. That means that most patients were either perimenopausal or postmenopausal. Uh, regarding the laterality of the tumors, the left ovary was more often involved. Um, there was tumor in the left ovary in 14 cases. This has an interesting reason uh, why. I'm gonna talk about that later. Six tumors were in the right side and two tumors were bilateral. The size also very wide range from 0.7 cm to 30 cm. Um, it's natural to think that these smaller tumors were likely uh, incidental findings, which seem to be the, the true for the majority of cases in the study, while the big tumors were likely connected to the patients that had uh, symptomatic presentation, either abdominal pain or distension or something like that, uh, mass effect, right? And about the cell types present, all of the tumors in this case series had both serous and mucinous epithelium. But from the 22 cases, eight of them presented with like a third epithelial phenotype. And this was termed endometrioid. I'll show you what it looks like later. Um, endometriosis was found in a couple of cases. Three patients had ipsilateral endometriosis. One patient had contralateral endometriosis. Two presented with endometriosis of the paratubal soft tissues one in the uterine serosa and one in the sigmoid colon and rectal serosa. And some of the cases were also associated with other Mullerian neoplasms. So one, uh, one patient presented with an endometrial carcinoma in the same ovary, whereas in the contralateral ovary, three patients had one an endometrial carcinoma, one a borderline serous tumor, and one a borderline clear cell tumor. Uh, some endometrial tumors in two patients were uh, also found. And one patient had a Mullerian clear cell carcinoma in the rectum. 
probably arising from endometriosis. So what, what do these tumors look like? Well, the, this is the basic morphology for a serum mucinous cyst adenoma or cyst adenofibroma. You have a single layer of a benign, bland-looking epithelium. Here you can see the uh, mucinous morphology at the top of the screen and at the bottom of the screen, the serous morphology. The same thing is true for the panel on the right, uh, but this one shows that sometimes with the distension of the glands, the epithelium can become attenuated. So sometimes it will be very thin and even hard to distinguish, but you can clearly see in this image that there's a mucinous gland on the top and a more serous looking gland on the bottom. In some tumors, the same gland showed both phenotypes, and this could occur uh, both as a sharp, abrupt transition, like you see on the left, you have a ciliated serous phenotype and it immediately shifts into a mucinous phenotype, or it could be uh, in the form of a gradual transition, like the image to the right, where you see both mucinous and serous phenotype, but you also see some cells that kind of fall in between that spectrum, show like an intermediate phenotype. Uh, these, this panel right here, it depicts the endometrioid type epithelium. Um, you have a serous gland on the bottom and on the top, notice how the epithelium is mucinous on the left and it starts uh, blending in with this uh, very eosinophilic, tufting, hobnail appearance epithelium. This is what the authors named as endometrioid uh, epithelium and it was found in eight cases in this series. Sometimes the endometrioid phenotype was associated with uh, pigmented stromal histiocytes and endometrioid type stroma, which seems to suggest that these tumors are even more associated with endometriosis, if you will. Uh, and most of the mucinous epithelium found in this case series was of endocervical type. So you had these tall columnar cells with clear uh, mucinous cytoplasm. But one case showed a more uh, intestinal phenotype with abundant goblet cells. So these two images are from that single case that showed a more uh, sort of enteric or gastrointestinal phenotype. But this was the exception. Most of them were of the endocervical appearance. So uh, obviously this uh, paper is very important because it's the first large series on benign ovarian serum mucinous tumors. And this just raises the question, is it because these tumors are uncommon or are these tumors underreported? And um, I think it's actually a little bit of both. So um, these are definitely less common than your run-of-the-mill uh, mucinous cis adenoma or a serous cis adenoma, which seem to be kind of ubiquitous if you are in GYN pathology practice. But there's also an element of underreporting going on. Um, I think a lot of pathologists may see a tumor like this and then opt uh, for whatever epithelial type is more prominent. Um, it will probably get called that. So if you have like, let's say 80% serous and 20% mucinous, some pathologists would just classify it as a serous cyst adenoma. Um, and this contributes to the underreporting. Also, there's another thing that contributes to that is that the, me the methods with which the author selected the cases. So when you go to the SNOMED codes, you need beforehand that a pathologist would identify the cases both serous and mucinous for the design of this study. But um, if you're working under the more recent WHO definition, just having more than one Millerian phenotype, Tumors that had the endometrioid and the serous, or for example, the mucinous and the endometrioid phenotypes together, they would still be called seromucinous by WHO convention. So, but, but they would be off the study. So that's also an element of underreporting. And, and that definition brings another question into play, which is, is seromucinous really the appropriate name for these tumors or would be, be better off calling them mixed epithelial neoplasm, considering that their current definition is more than one Millerian phenotype, not necessarily mucinous and serous together. Uh, most of the cases are have a fairly straightforward diagnosis. These can be easily done by morphology. 
But in case you're having trouble differentiating between these two types of epithelium, whether they're attenuated or something like that, you could use uh, WT1 immunohistochemistry, for example, to differentiate between the serous phenotype, which would probably be positive for WH, WT1 versus the other phenotypes. And you could also use mucin stains to prove that a specific gland shows a mucinous phenotype. But these are uh, not normally necessary. And this study also confirmed the association with endometriosis, which is something that we already knew to be true for the borderline tumors of this category. And this association with endometriosis is connected to the left side predominance, which to me is really interesting because it's not something uh, entirely intuitive to think about. So why are these tumors more common on the left side? Um, most of the large studies covering endometriosis have shown that endometriosis is also more common on the left side. And this is partly attributed to the fact that the sigmoid colon in the left side, it prevents uh, or at least hinders the flow of peritoneal fluid. And that would make that side of the pelvic or the abdominal cavity more susceptible to endometriosis and subsequent uh, endometriosis associated lesions. So that's, that to me was a really interesting fact that I was previously unaware about. Um, as to strengths and areas for improvement, I think one of the strengths of this uh, paper is that it provides a thorough assessment of the histologic characteristics while uh, cyst adenomas and cyst adenofibromas are quite simple in terms of their architecture and morphology. This also means that they can be overlooked very easily. So I think this paper provides a nice detailed um, morphological description and also a very detailed historical context in the discussion section, which would be a little bit beyond the scope of this presentation. But especially if you're a trainee, I think it's very worthy uh, to read the discussion section in this article to understand how did this category of tumors evolved and how did the terminology evolved over time. And as to areas for improvement, I would definitely say that molecular characteriz characterization is necessary. Um, at this point, we don't really know what are the molecular changes behind the benign seromucinous tumors. And there's two questions that come to mind. Are all the benign seromucinous tumors molecularly similar or are the ones that have an endometrioid phenotype different from the ones that don't have that phenotype? It's a question that still remains to be answered. And also, do the benign and the borderline seromucinous tumors exist along a continuum like we think they do, or are they actually just different categories of tumor? This is also an interesting question that still needs to be addressed. Uh, in terms of applications, I think what this paper does is it uh, provides a more structured approach to diagnosis. So hopefully this leads to increased recognition, which leads to more knowledge about these tumors. We're gonna get more papers and just more overall information. And uh, the bottom line take home message is don't be afraid to diagnose a seromucinous benign tumor. Um, we do need to increase the numbers of these cases in order to find out what's really driving the pathogenesis of these tumors. And the image to the right I chose just to illustrate, it's a case that I had back in April here at Women and Infants, and it shows a very nice uh, ambiguous phenotype in the same gland. Notice how the ciliated serous type epithelium just blends in with the mucinous uh, phenotype. So I just thought it looked very nice and was a nice complement to the presentation. Did, did you sign that case out as a seromucinous cyst? Yes, we did. Awesome. <laughs> it took a little convincing to do, but we did. Taking care of the problem. That's great. Yes. That was a really good summary. I, I also agree. Um, I specifically noted on the this article that the discussion was really great. I think um, sometimes when you're a trainee or you're coming into reading research, sometimes it's intimidating to know the backstory, but I thought they did a really nice job here of sort of walking through all the different things and the problems. And sometimes you almost felt like you were um, coming back to the beginning, you know, like they would cite a problem and then it would come back to the same thing. Um, it was um, and it, really great attention to detail. And then it kind of dissected different theories about how these sister rises and it gave supporting and then sort of detracting evidence for each one. So, um, and I also found, like you said, the methods section very interesting because the cases were selected based on someone sort of double tagging mm -hmm. cysts. 
And I don't know what your experience is, but my experience is that sometimes um, when you're putting those tags on, you do or don't do it consistently. I'm sure um, some people do and some people don't. So I always wonder, you know, if there's an institution, I'm not saying for this article in particular, but if you have an institution with multiple faculty, are they all doing it uniformly or are Absolutely. you sort of enriching for certain people who are more, you know, more I diligent think about? It takes a lot of effort to standardize this type of coding, right? So a lot exactly. of institutions have uh, problems with that. It's not exactly, but it's also very hard to search for it otherwise, because then you would be searching through, I don't even know how many sort of ovarian cysts that come yeah. out. I think and the only way to really find out would be to like, just get all the cyst adenomas, which might mm -hmm. be a particularly inaccurate if you're working in a large institution. Just right, you probably have to just do it for a month or two months, or yeah. <laughs> it depends on many specimens. But I will say, signing these specimens out, you probably have a similar experience. Is that they, a lot of them have overlapping morphology, and the you know some of it gets very attenuated, and then the other places you swear there's a ciliated area, and then other places you swear it's mucinous, and sometimes mm -hmm. you just think, well, you know, um, maybe it's not that as big of a deal because everything I'm thinking about is benign. Um, um, so someone did ask a question, but we can go ahead and do the polling. Um, Hanan, if you want to look at the question while I'm doing the polling, yeah, sure. then you can. Um, so I'm going to launch the poll for this one now. And folks should be able to take that. And I'm going to share the screen of the questions so those who are watching the video online can also see it. OK. Go ahead and end the poll and share the results. So this first question was, which of the following is true regarding benign ovarian seromucinous tumors? And the answer was endometrioid type hobnail epithelium is found in a subset of cases. Um, the uh, first answer is, is just not true. The benign ovarian seromucinous association with endometriosis, that's also not true. They were some, some of them did have endometriosis, but not all of them. And then the mucinous epithelium in these tumors is most commonly of enteric type. That's also not true. So um, that's a nice review question. And then the final question was, oh, and I'm sorry for a percentage wise, 73% of folks answered the correct one. Um, and then that 19% of people did choose to, to go back up the benign ovarian serum mucinous tumors occur exclusively in association with endometriosis. They were associated with it in a significant number of cases, but not all cases. So the second question, um, the answer was an association between benign ovarian serum mucinous tumors and endometriate elements was common. Um, and then the first three, um, let's see what percentage of people answered that. So 92%, so it doesn't really seem. Um, and then it says, there is no evidence to support serum mucinous cystadenoma as a distinct entity and the terminology should be discontinued. So this segues nicely into our question. <laughs> Dr. Romero, sure. because um, I think what 8% of people picked this answer, 92% of folks chose the final answer. So um, one of the questions someone asked was, seromucinous tumors are now a subtype of endometrioid tumors in the new WHO classification rather than being a category on their own. Is this addressed in the paper? Would you yeah, like I to- I can just... take that question. So this, uh, this question, that this uh, new form of sort of classification. This happened in the recent 2020 WHO edition, and it's the seromucinous carcinomas that were discontinued. Right. So um, through the studies that we have available about the molecular profile of these tumors, they found that the seromucinous carcinomas seem to overlap significantly with endometrioid carcinomas. Yes. So these two were grouped together, and now seromucinous carcinoma is a subtype of uh, endometrioid carcinoma. But for the borderline and the benign categories, it's still a separate entity. Yes. Um, yes. And also, this is addressed in the paper. This is in the discussion section. They talk about that briefly. Yeah, very helpful that one of the co-authors of the paper was also writing the ch chapter for the WHO, <laughs> so they knew what it was going to say. <laughs> but um, it's a. Uh, it's true, right? They kept the borderline. And then um, the studies that came out that seromucinous carcinoma was very poorly reproducible. And it also, like you said, shared so many uh, characteristics with endometrioid. They just lumped it there. So I think that was a really good distinction to make. Um, um, and I, I think the other question is about the how much do you need to call a tumor a seromucinous tumor? How mm -hmm. uh, much in terms of percentage? Mm -hmm. So the current definition is you need more than one Millerian phenotype 
-hmm. regardless of which one it is. Right. And they, they need to be at least 10% of the volume. So right. let's say you have 90% serous and 10% mucinous. That's enough for calling it zero mucinous. Right. According to the current classification. Yes. And then someone else commented that it will be interesting to see how these tumors overlap molecularly. And I think I, I would imagine someone's hard at work on that. So um, I think that's all the questions and all the polling. And I would just remind everyone to, on your way out of the meeting, uh, you will be asked to take a survey that helps me improve this um, format. And also um, happy holidays to everyone celebrating. It's a end of the year here in the States and it's Hanukkah and, and Christmas and other holidays. So um, I hope everyone out there is staying safe and um, come back in January, we'll be presenting about fallopian tube. So thank you all for joining us. And if you, uh, the presenters all wanna turn on your cameras and if anybody wants to say goodbye. Uh, thank, thank you all you so, so much, much for presenting. You, you all did wonderful. Thanks for giving us the opportunity. Yeah, happy 2020 everyone. Woo, we're done. <laughs> thank you.